So in this lecture, we are going to discuss the topic of article spinning. This is meant to be a high-level lecture to describe what this problem is and why you might care. Note that there are many possible approaches to this problem, and this section will discuss one. So I hope that helps to distinguish this lecture from the next. This lecture is meant to describe the problem, while the next lecture is meant to describe one possible solution. Okay, so what is article spinning? So imagine you've just decided to start your own blog. It may be helpful if you've had experience with this in the past. One fact that becomes painfully apparent to all bloggers once they've started blogging is that just because you've written something does not mean other people will read it. And of course, you didn't just start your blog to sit there and collect dust. Perhaps your goal is to get lots of readers, simply because it is satisfying to know that others have read what you've written. Perhaps your goal is to sell products on your blog. Perhaps your goal is to make money from ads on your blog. In all of these cases, the common theme is that you need people to actually visit your blog. So how might that be done? Well, in today's era, perhaps you might start by sharing your blog with your friends and family. That's okay, but there are two problems with this approach. Firstly, is that it does not scale. You want thousands of visitors, and you surely do not have thousands of friends and family. Secondly, is that it's not targeted. If your blog is about machine learning and data science, it is unlikely that your friends and family really care, even if they may pretend to at first. In fact, one of the major ways you're going to get people to your blog is via search. And by search, I mean Google, DuckDuckGo, Bing, and so forth. I assume that because you're on this website, you know what these are. Now again, just because you've created a website does not imply that it will get a good listing on these search engines. Search engines tend to rank websites higher if they are more popular and more authoritative. One way to accomplish this is to simply create lots of content. By creating more content about different topics, you have a better chance of attracting more people. So how do you create more content? Well, the simple answer is you just have to write it yourself. Now take it from me, writing content is not easy. It takes lots of time and effort. But what if there was a way to write content automatically, that is, to have a machine generate content for you. So this is where article spinning enters the picture. Perhaps you may have thought that you could simply copy and paste articles from other websites onto your blog. Note that this does not work, since search engines are smart enough to know that your site has simply duplicated the content of another. In fact, this will lead to your site being penalized and your search rankings will get worse. So this is not something you want to do. One option that was popular in the early 2000s and 2010s was to spin content. That is, take an existing article and replace enough words so that it becomes sufficiently different from the original. The trick is to replace words in such a manner that the result still makes sense. Now, of course, you could just do this manually, but that still takes time and effort. Ideally, the whole process would be automatic. And perhaps one way to accomplish that would be through building a language model based on probabilistic patterns. Now, to give you some sense of the real world application of this, I have seen actual software that does this exact thing. I personally haven't used it, but I've watched others use it long ago with decent success. Note that this was before machine learning became popular, so the techniques being used weren't as advanced as deep learning and neural networks. Basically, what you would do is select a word you want to replace, and the software would give you a drop-down list of suggestions. You could then click on one of those suggestions to replace the original word. So it wasn't completely automated, but in some sense, it at least augmented the capabilities of the human. Now, the reason why this still requires a human in the loop is because, as mentioned, machine learning hadn't really taken off at this time. And the people who did understand the state of the art in machine learning weren't applying it to applications like these. So we will start by applying Markov models, which have been around for about 100 years. 
In other words, not so advanced. However, remember that the goal of this isn't to build a modern article spinning product. If I were to do that, I would charge you thousands of dollars. The goal of this is to learn about Markov models, which is the current section of this course. Many beginners mix this up, which is what I saw often in V1, and so it's important to go into this with the right mindset. Furthermore, note that in more advanced sections and courses, we will learn about transformers, which will do a much better job at this task. So if your goal is to simply get the state of the art in one line of code, that would be a much better place to go. One fact, which I find quite amusing, is that when version 1 of this course was released, transformers did not even exist. So we wouldn't even be having this discussion five years ago. What was funny was, a lot of beginners came to that course, thinking you could actually build a human-level article spinner that would just magically write an article out of thin air. Of course, I had to tell them that no such magic actually existed, at which point they got very angry. Funny to me, but frustrating for them, I'm sure. In any case, nowadays, there are many ways to improve upon Markov models, including RNNs and transformers, but these are far beyond the technical level at this point in the course. At this point, your goal should be exercising your understanding of Markov models. Now, if you are interested in these more advanced techniques, don't despair since they are actually based on what you learn here. So in fact, these are a prerequisite to understanding these new advancements. And as a final note on this topic, please be aware that article spinning is a black hat SEO technique. Generally speaking, these techniques are not ethical, and more practically, they never work for very long, if they do at all. Thus, if your goal is to actually build a good and sustainable website that people enjoy, this is likely not the way. Furthermore, you also have to remember that Google invented transformers. So if you're going to try and use transformers to fool Google, realize that they are way ahead of you. There is simply no way you can trick them using their own technology, which by the time you see it is already old to them. Okay, so just remember, you are in this course, not because you're trying to fool Google, because practically you cannot. You are in this course because you want to learn NLP. Okay, so in this lecture, we will be looking at how to apply n-gram models to the article spinning task. This will be similar to the Markov models we studied in the past, but with a twist. Let's begin by reviewing what we know about Markov models so far. Suppose that we'd like to build a first-order Markov model for language. That is, we'd like to be able to predict the next word from the current word. In this case, we can estimate a probability distribution of next words given current words. As you recall, this is simply done by counting. If we want to know how often wt follows wt-1, we count how many times that occurs and divide that by how many times wt-1 appeared as a unigram. But suppose we'd like to have a richer model. Suppose that, instead of depending on just one password, we would like to depend on two passwords. In this case, we would build a second-order Markov model for language. We want to know the probability that wt appears, given that wt-1 and wt-2 already appeared. Again, we estimate this by counting the number of trigrams for wt-2, wt-1, and wt in our text corpus. We then divide this by the bigram count for wt-2 and wt-1. So one way we saw that we could use the trigram model was to generate poetry. That is, given the previous two generated words, randomly select the next word, and so on and so forth. For article spinning, our problem is a bit different. It's not that we want to generate text from start to end. Instead, our job is to replace text. We want to replace text in such a way that it still makes sense in the context of the text that came before, as well as the text that comes after. 
So here is a simple idea. How about we create a distribution for wt, given wt minus 1, the previous word, and wt plus 1, the next word. This is still a trigram model, except that the dependency structure is a bit different. Now, luckily, the way that we estimate this trigram probability is pretty much the same as what you would expect. It's simply the count of the trigram, wt minus 1, wt, and wt plus 1, divided by the count for the context window, wt minus 1, and wt plus 1. Okay, so hopefully you're convinced that this is pretty much exactly the same approach that we used before. As you recall, this is the maximum likelihood estimate. Now, it's probably a good idea to make sure that this approach even makes sense. Consider the context words production and to. Here are some actual middle words from the dataset we'll be using. So some examples are began, capacity, closer, continued, and facilities. You can imagine how all of these could be used in a sentence. Production began to speed up in Q1. Apple's production capacity to build iPhones increased. The COO brought production closer to the company's headquarters, and so on and so forth. Note that there is one potential issue that may arise. Not all of these middle words are the same part of speech. Sometimes it's a noun, whereas other times it's a verb, whereas other times it's an adjective. So it's very possible you'll encounter a weird looking result if you replace a verb with a noun or some other part of speech that does not belong. In this case, you are changing the grammar of the sentence, which will not work. There are a couple additions you could use to try and fix this issue, which are exercises at the end of the coming notebook. In this lecture, I will be giving you an official exercise prompt in order to complete the article spinner. Now, technically, you already know what the exercise is, so this lecture is more of a reminder to do it. In addition, I'll provide a few details in case you find them helpful. As usual, you can feel free to look at the solution at notebook to get the data set, but please do not go further, as this will ruin the exercise for you. Okay, so the data set we'll be using is the BBC News data once again. Our model will be trained on the business articles only, so if you want to make your model like the solution, you'll need to filter out these articles. You may find that you prefer to train on all the articles, or perhaps on a different data set entirely, such as Wikipedia. Whatever data set you use, it is up to you. Personally, I think it would be more interesting if you used Wikipedia, since the dataset is much larger and contains much more text per article. However, it would take more work. If you're interested in doing this, you can find archived versions of Wikipedia at dumps.wikimedia.org. Note that the last time I checked, these were stored as XML files, so you'll need to do some work in order to parse these into plain text. Another option is to use our poetry data, that is, poems by either Robert Frost or Edgar Allan Poe. I think this would be interesting as well. Okay, so once you've decided what text you want to use, your next task will be to build the model we described. Our model is essentially a three-dimensional matrix, where the two context words are used as conditioning variables for the middle word. In terms of arrays which you'll store in Python, this is no different than the second order Markov model, except the ordering of the dimensions will be switched around. That is, in either of these cases, conceptually you have a V by V by V matrix. In addition, you may want to consider whether it is better to store the distributions in a Python dictionary. As you recall, this also requires you to be able to sample from a probability distribution, which is represented as a dictionary. Note that we've written this code before, so there is no need for you to figure it out again. Now, there are some details about the language model that would be worth discussing. Specifically, what should we consider as tokens?
As you recall, one method is to simply drop all punctuation and use words as tokens. Another method is to keep punctuation using NLTK's word tokenize. Another method is to simply use a string split, which keeps the punctuation by default, although in this case, the punctuation will be stuck to the adjacent word. In the coming solution, we'll be using NLTK's word tokenize, which I think is appropriate for this task because it keeps punctuation as separate tokens. So for example, if a sentence ends with a question mark and we replace the word before it, then the new word will also have come from a question. Furthermore, this will be helpful when we string the sentence back together after it has been spun. Otherwise, it would be difficult to read the result because we wouldn't immediately know where one sentence starts and another ends. We also wouldn't know which sentences are statements, which are questions, and so forth. We would also lose units of measurement where there are numbers. So for example, since we'll be looking at business articles, there will be many documents containing monetary values. So keeping punctuation is useful. Now, once you have your model, you'll need to write a function to actually spin the article. This is pretty straightforward, but still requires some work. You'll need to figure out which words you want to replace, and also how often to replace them. For example, if you replace every word, then the result won't even resemble the original, nor will it be likely to even make sense. You'll also need to consider certain details, like do you want to ever replace two words in a row? Furthermore, you'll want to think about how to check whether a word can be replaced. For some words, there simply may not be any other options, since the trigram is unique. Another interesting task to consider is, we'll end up with a tokenized document, but how are we going to put it back together so that it looks like something we can read? One way to do this is to use the join function in Python. However, this is not perfect because, for example, if we join each token with a space, then we'll be putting spaces before punctuation as well. And of course, this is not correct syntax for English. Instead, we'll be using a class called TreeBank Word Detokenizer from NLTK, which can be used to detokenize a list of tokens. So once you've finished spinning your article, you should print the result, which displays both the original words and the replacements so that it's easy to compare. And this will require you to detokenize the tokens. So good luck, and I'll see you in the next lecture. So in this lecture, we will be looking at the notebook to implement the article spinner in code. We'll begin by downloading our dataset, which is the BBC News dataset, as we've seen in previous lectures. The next step is to do our imports. Of note here is the text wrap module. This is helpful when we print out our spun article, since if we don't wrap the text, each paragraph will go off the screen. Also make note of the TreeBank Word Detokenizer class, which is used to detokenize a list of tokens back into a single string. In the real world, this is necessary, since that's how your article will eventually be presented. The next step is to download the necessary data files for NLTK. The next step is to load in our data using pd.readcsv. The next step is to call df.head to remind ourselves what our data looks like. So as you recall, we have two columns, which are the text and the labels. The next step is to cast our labels to a set to remind ourselves what labels we have. As you recall, we're going to be choosing just one of these labels to train our model. As mentioned, you can feel free to use the whole data set if you like, or even a completely different data set, which you find interesting. 
The next step is to set our label of choice, which for the purpose of this lecture will be business. Please feel free to pick a different label if you like. The next step is to grab only the text for only the rows that match our chosen label. As always, recall that you can read this from the inside out. The inside part is where we select only the rows that match our label. Once we've done that, we can grab the appropriate column, which is text. Once we have the result, we'll call the head function once again to check the result. Okay, so as you can see, the result appears to be a Panda series containing only business articles, which is what we expect. The next step is to create our model. As you recall, we can break this into two parts. The first part is to count the number of possible outcomes, and the second part is to normalize the counts so that they become probabilities. So this block of code pertains to the first part. We'll begin by creating an empty dictionary called probs. Note that this will be a dictionary of dictionaries. The key for this dictionary will be a tuple of context words. In our case, that's the previous word and the next word. The value for this dictionary will be another dictionary. For the nested dictionary, the keys will be possible middle words. The value will be the corresponding count for the corresponding middle word. The next step is to loop through all of our documents. Inside the loop, we will first split the document into lines. As you recall, each document contains multiple paragraphs, which are separate lines. This includes the title of the article, and the text. The next step is to loop through each line, or in other words, loop through each paragraph. Inside this inner loop, we will then tokenize the line by calling word tokenize. This will give us a list of tokens. The next step is to loop through the tokens. Now, you'll notice that I'm not looping through the tokens directly. This is because on each iteration, we'll need to grab three tokens simultaneously. That is to say, we are actually iterating through trigrams. This is why we want to loop through the index instead of the token, and also why we stop at len tokens minus two. So inside this third loop, we start by grabbing our three tokens. Notice that these are three consecutive tokens at index i, i plus one, and i plus two. The next step is to form the key to our dictionary, which is a tuple containing t0 and t2. Obviously, T1 is the middle word. The next step is to check whether or not this key exists in our probs dictionary. If it does not, we should create an entry for it, which will be initialized as an empty dictionary. The next step is to increment the count for the middle word, T1. To do this, we have to handle two cases the case where t1 is not present already, and the case where it is. So if t1 is not present, we simply set the count to 1. However, if t1 is present, then we increment the count by using plus equals 1. Okay, so hopefully you're convinced that by the end of this loop, our dictionary will contain the proper counts. The next step is to normalize the counts we just collected. To do this, we're going to begin by looping through each key value pair in probs. In this case, key represents the tuple of context words, and D represents the probability for the middle word. Except these are not probabilities just yet. For now, they are just counts. In order to turn them into probabilities, we'll need the total count, which is the sum of all the values in D. Once we have the total, we can then loop through D itself. In this case, the key is the middle word, and the value is the count. Inside this loop, we turn this into a probability by dividing the current count by the total count. The next step is to print out our probs dictionary to confirm that it has the correct format. Okay, so it appears that our dictionary looks like it should. 
The key is a tuple of the two context words, and the value is a probability dictionary. Note that for some trigrams, there is only one possible middle word. For these cases, we probably wouldn't bother to try and replace those words, because the result would be no change. However, note that for some keys, there are many possible words. For example, make note of the key US giant. In this case, many trigrams could make sense. US agrochemical giant, US banking giant, US foods giant, US media giant, and so forth. So typical business news. Also, notice how our punctuation is tokenized. So you could have jumped 1.8% or jumped 10.7%. Okay, so at this point, our model is complete. The next part is to figure out how to actually use the model to spin articles. Conceptually, it's simple, but as you'll see, there are a few details we need to contend with. Firstly, let's recall that each line in a document is a paragraph. So if we grab the first article at iLoc0 and we split on new lines, we should be able to see a list of paragraphs. So notice that some lines are simply empty, which is because our articles are formatted to have an empty line between paragraphs. The next step is to write a function called spin document. The main idea of this function is that it's a higher level function. Basically, we're going to break our problem down into slightly smaller parts, which is to spin each paragraph one by one. So the point of this function is to simply call another function, which will spin each paragraph. It's also responsible for joining the paragraphs back together at the end so that the result has the same format as the input. Okay, so as input, we take in a variable called doc, which is a string representing the entire document. Inside the function, we begin by splitting the document by new line. As you recall, we just did this above, so you know what the result looks like. We'll also create an empty list called output, where we will store each spun paragraph as they are received. The next step is to enter a loop, which will loop through each line or each paragraph. Inside the loop, we will check whether the line is empty or not. If it is not, then we call the spin line function, which we have not yet seen. The result is called new line. Otherwise, the line is simply an empty line, and we can set new line equal to line. Once we have our new line variable, we can then append it to our output list. Once we finish our loop, we can then join the output by a new line character, which will reverse the split we did above. So the main thing on your mind at this point should be, what does the spin line function look like? But before we get into that, we need to think about how to detokenize a list of tokens. As you recall, we need to tokenize each paragraph in order to spin the article. But once it's been spun, we need to turn the list of tokens back into a string. The hard part about this is, sometimes tokens should be joined by a space, but sometimes they should be joined without a space. For example, if we have two words side by side, we would like to join those with a space. But if we have a word and punctuation, then we would not want to put a space between them. In order to do this, we're going to make use of a class called TreeBank Word Detokenizer. We'll begin by creating an instance of this class. The next step is to pick a random sentence from one of our documents. At this point, we just want to print this out to confirm that if we tokenize and then detokenize this sentence, we end up with the same sentence. So now that we know what our sentence looks like, the next step will be to call word tokenize on this sentence. This will return a list of tokens. On that list of tokens, we are then going to call detokenize using our detokenizer object that we just created. Okay, so as you can see, the detokenized string is the same as the original string. 
This means that the punctuation has been treated correctly without spaces at the appropriate points. The next step is to define our sample word function, which will sample a random word from a probability distribution represented as a dictionary. As you recall, this is the same as what we've seen before, so I won't explain it again. The next step is to implement our spin line function. As input, this takes in one line as a string. Inside the function, we begin by calling word tokenize to get a list of tokens. We'll also initialize an index to start at zero, which will be used while we loop through the tokens. The reason we are not using a for loop will become clear later on. We'll also initialize our output at this point, which will be a list containing just the first token. Note that the first token cannot be spun because there is no previous word. The next step will be to enter a while loop up to len tokens minus two. As before, the reason we stop at minus two is because we'll be indexing three tokens at a time. Inside the loop, we'll grab our three tokens at indices i, i plus one, and i plus two. The next step will be to form our key, which is a tuple containing the previous token t0 and the next token t2. The next step is to grab the probability distribution corresponding to this key. That is, the distribution of all possible middle words. We'll call the result pdist. The next step is to check whether or not we should replace this middle word. So the next if statement defines when we should do this. Note that we are using two criteria. The first criteria is obvious, and that is that the length of pdist must be bigger than one. If it is not, then there is no possibility of replacing this word with something else. The second criterion is stochastic. We generate a random number and then check whether or not that random number is below 0.3. Basically, this will control how often words are replaced. As you recall, the random function draws a number uniformly between a 0 and a 1. Therefore, by using a threshold of 0 0.3, we're saying there's a probability of 30% to replace each word that can be replaced. Okay, so if we want to replace this middle word, then we enter this if statement. The next step is to find a replacement for the word. To do this, we simply call the function sample word, passing in the probability dictionary pdist. We'll call the result middle. Now, because it would be nice to compare each replacement with the original, we're still going to append t1 to the output list. The next step will be to append middle, surrounded by angle brackets. Since these brackets are unlikely to occur in the news articles, it should be unambiguous when we see these in the result. Finally, we'll also append the next word, t2. What this means is that we will never replace two words in a row. It's not that you can't, but I've simply decided not to. In this case, because we've effectively added two new words to the output, we're going to increment i by two. So this is the reason we did not use a for loop. If we had used a for loop, we would always be incrementing by one but this lets us control how much to increment i. The next step is to look at the else block. In this case, we are not replacing the middle word. Therefore, we simply append a t1 to the output list. We also increment i by one instead of two. Okay, so by this point, we will be outside the while loop. There is one final thing we need to consider, which is the value of i. At this point, i could be either one or two steps away from the end of the sentence because we may have incremented i by one or two on the last step of the loop. Therefore, the behavior will be different depending on what we just did. Now, if we incremented i by two, that means we replaced the second last token and we appended the final token to the output list. And since we incremented i by two, that means i will be greater than len tokens minus two. In that case, there is nothing else to do.
In the other case, where we did not increment i by 2, that means we did not replace the second last token. In that case, we incremented i by 1, and so i is equal to len tokens minus 2. In this case, we still have yet to append the final token, so that is what we do at this point. The final step, once the output list is complete, is to call the detokenize function to convert our list of tokens back into a single string. Okay, so the next step is to set a random seed so that we get consistent results. Feel free to comment this out in order to see different documents. The next step is to randomly choose a document and call the spin document function on that document. The next step is to print out our document using the text wrap module so that the text does not go off the screen. Okay, so let's have a look at the results. Firstly, you'll notice that sometimes the original word is replaced with the same word. This is possible since the middle words are randomly selected. And of course, the original word is one of the possibilities. Note that if you wanted to force the word to change, you could temporarily set its probability to zero. Okay, so notice that the first part of the first paragraph appears okay. It says, shares in train and plane making giant Bombardier have fallen to a 10 year low against the hands of its chief executive. It obviously doesn't make sense if you're a serious reader of this type of news, but it is grammatically correct. In fact, it's not difficult to find articles online that make even less sense. Note that the second part of the sentence does not make sense. It ends with, and two members of the keyboard. So let's think about why this might happen. As you recall, our model looks at trigrams only. It does not consider the rest of the context in the sentence. So if you only look at this trigram, the keyboard, it makes complete sense. This is because you might have a sentence like, the keyboard members were present at the meeting. But the reason this does not make sense is because the word members appears earlier in the sentence. Thus, this is a hint that it might be useful to consider context beyond just the previous to next word. Let's now consider the next sentence, which says, Paul Tellier, which was also Bombardier's epicenter, left the company amid an 80 million pound restructuring. Again, it's kind of a weird sentence, but it's not completely wrong. It makes grammatical sense, but it does not make logical sense. So we normally do not use the word which to refer to a person, but rather who, which was the original word. Of course, our model doesn't know this because the previous token in the context was just a comma. Another funny replacement is epicenter, which replaced the word president. Again, grammatically it's not bad, but if you wanted to improve this, you would have to take into account very long range dependencies. Specifically, this word still refers to the first two tokens in the sentence, which are now quite a few tokens behind. So this suggests the need for a model that can perhaps look at a variable number of previous tokens, and also one that can learn long range dependencies. Keep these ideas in mind when you study deep learning and neural networks. Okay, so let's check the next sentence. Laurent Baudouin, part of the family that controls the Montreal-based firm, will take over the role of CEO under a newly created management structure. So this one makes perfect sense. By the way, notice how for some reason the detokenizer is failing at these points. So let's check out the next sentence. Analysts believe the resignations seem to have stemmed from a boardroom dispute. This also makes sense, but note that it changes the meaning of the sentence. Okay, so the next sentence definitely does not make sense, although it is close. Under Mr. Tellier's tenure at the subsidy, which began in July 2003, 
according to Cut the Worldwide Workforce of 75,000 by signing a movement by 2006 were announced. And of course, this does not make sense because the model does not account for long-range dependencies. Okay, so let's move on to the next sentence. The firm's auto division and defense services unit were also sold and Bombardier started the future of a new aircraft seating 110 to 135 passengers. In this case, I would say that the result makes sense. So the next two sentences mostly make sense. Mr. Tellier had indicated he wanted to expand at the industry's top train maker and third largest manufacturer of civil aircraft until the restructuring was complete. But Bombardier has been charged with a declining share price and profits. In my opinion, these replacements are not bad. So notice that the next sentence has quite a few replacements. Earlier this month, the government said it earned $100 million, 19.2 million pounds, for the third quarter, down from a bid of $133 million a year ago. Again, this sentence doesn't make logical sense, but it does make grammatical sense. Okay, so the next sentence is a bit of a mess. Notice that the first part looks okay. I understand the UK's concern that I would not be there for the long term. However, in the middle, we can see that the word and is replaced by a double quote. In the context of trigrams, this makes sense, but relative to the overall sentence, it does not make sense since the quotes now don't balance out. Note that the ending of the sentence also looks okay. Mr. Tellier said in a meeting on agriculture. Obviously, this doesn't make any sense relative to the semantics of the article, but grammatically it works. Okay, so since these articles are quite long, I think that's enough for this lecture. However, I do encourage you to look at more on your own. And furthermore, think about why this article spinner behaves like it does. In particular, think about things like the size of the context window and long-term dependencies. It's also worth thinking about what level of understanding is really required to spin an article and make sure it makes sense semantically. That is, without changing the meaning of what it says. Consider whether or not anything like that currently exists. At this time, the state of the art is GPT-3, and the consensus is that we are close, but still not there. Also consider whether or not anything like that is possible at all. What level of intelligence would be required? From what I've seen, this is a much bigger leap than a lot of people think, especially for those who are new to machine learning. In version 1 of this course, I was surprised at how many beginners thought something like human-level understanding could just exist. And this was 5 years ago, before transformers were even invented. From my perspective, this just goes to show that there is a pretty wide gap between what AI can do in reality versus what the public thinks AI can do. So if you're new to this course or you're new to machine learning, it's a good idea to really think about whether your expectations are based on reality or if they are based on maybe misinformation that you got on YouTube or elsewhere. Now, that being said, there are some ways you could extend this article spinner to make it better even without considering deep learning and neural networks. Consider these to be extension exercises for this section. So as you recall, sometimes words that are replaced in a trigram make sense in the context of the trigram, but not in the context of the full sentence. One way you could potentially address this issue is to take parts of speech into account. In this way, you'll at least have a greater chance of the result making sense. Here's another idea. Often, we neglect to consider simple yet effective tools. This idea is to simply use a dictionary which contains synonyms. As you recall, a synonym means words that have the same meaning. For example, fast and quick, or small and tiny. Note that this does not require any probabilistic model at all. Furthermore, you could also combine this approach with the parts of speech extension. 
Yet another option, which has its pros and cons, is to simply make the context window larger. For example, account for more previous words and account for more future words. However, note that this introduces a data problem since you're increasing the dimensionality of the distribution. So this is another instance of the curse of dimensionality. Consider how unlikely it would be to encounter the same 5 gram more than once. Note also that the context window does not have to be symmetric. So you could depend on two previous words, but only one next word, or one previous words and two next words. Now, one thing you may be thinking at this point is, this article spinner doesn't seem to work that well. Of course, this should not be a surprise, given that we are only using simple trigrams without considering parts of speech or other context. Recall that other techniques, especially those involving deep learning, can be applied to the same idea of replacing a middle word given surrounding words. Unlike trigrams, deep learning techniques can account for more context, as well as potentially learn hidden structure, such as grammar and parts of speech. However, since we are not yet at that point in the course, you will just have to wait until you're able to increase your knowledge. That is, you must further gather the prerequisites you need in order to progress to those more advanced techniques. That being said, it's worth comparing these results to the screenshot of the article spinner program I showed you earlier in this section. In fact, what you have seen is on par with applications which people actually pay for. Remember that these spinner programs don't just replace words automatically, they give you a list of suggestions to choose from. So even just knowing what you know so far, this is enough to build a product that people will happily spend their money on. And that brings us to the topic of this lecture, which is all about article spinning gone wrong. So I won't be naming any names, but I'm sure if you watch machine learning videos on YouTube, you've come across this story yourself. So this story is about a pretty popular YouTuber who made videos about machine learning. Now it's important to realize that these weren't technical videos, they just pretended to be. For instance, he would make a video like, watch me build a stock trading bot in 5 minutes, but it was really code that he took from someone else's GitHub. It was more for entertainment than it was about increasing your technical ability. Of course, he would never be able to explain the code because he didn't write it himself, nor even try to understand it. He was not a machine learning expert, but rather only someone who played one on YouTube. As a side note, whenever I make videos like common beginner mistakes when predicting stock prices with LSTMs, these are some of the kinds of videos I'm referring to. So anyway, it wasn't long until this fellow decided to publish his own paper on the topic of neural qubits. Sounds pretty advanced. Unfortunately, the entire paper was plagiarized. As mentioned, this was not an actual machine learning practitioner, only one who pretended to be on YouTube. Sadly, some people still believe this YouTuber actually knows about machine learning. Luckily, this paper wasn't published anywhere reputable, but rather just a weird website called Vixra, which is known for publishing works by crazy people. So the main highlight of this paper is that it really makes no attempt to hide that it is completely plagiarized. Both the images and math formulas were simply screenshots of the original. And this would be highly unusual if it were a true academic paper. For the text portion, the basic strategy was to do something similar to what we described in this section. Simply replace random words with synonyms, hoping that they would still make sense in context. So what was the result? Well, there were some very strange replacements. For example, quantum gate was changed to quantum door. Of course, in everyday language, gate can certainly be a synonym for door. The problem is that was not the case in this context. In this context, gate refers to a logic gate. For example, and, or, not, XOR, and so forth. Another popular example is complex Hilbert space, which was changed to complicated Hilbert space.
And of course, in everyday language, complex can be a synonym to complicated. For example, beginners who don't meet the prerequisites to my courses think my courses are too complex. This has the same meaning as beginners think my courses are too complicated. But in this context, complex does not mean complicated, but rather it's referring to complex numbers. So in fact, one downside to this approach is that it did not take context into account like we did in this course. Thus, one could say that if this YouTuber had used the techniques in this course, he wouldn't have made such silly mistakes. Now, my goal in this lecture is not to make fun of this YouTuber, although it is a very interesting story. But there are many lessons here. Firstly, notice that this method of content spinning really is in use in the real world. It may sound like I've just made this up for the purpose of this course, but it really is a real-world practical use case. Secondly, and most importantly, notice how it is not hard to detect. So if you want to be taken seriously or to publish content that people actually enjoy and respect, this is not the way to do it. Not only was this easily detected by people, but it would be just as easy for machines as well.